Welcome to Glass Chats. Today I am speaking to Alison Lowry, who is in County Down. It's the 20th of April 2020, and uh, we're delighted, Alison, to have you join us today for Glass Chats. So just tell us a little bit about your glass story, your background, and um, did you grow up in County Down? Is that where you're actually from originally? Yep. I grew up, this is a wee tiny, tiny town in County Down called Saintfield, and I grew up here. And I suppose when I was about 20, moved into Belfast for 10 years, and then I've moved back since I've had my family. And my mother couldn't believe it, she still lives here. <clears throat> so she couldn't believe that I'd want to move back because I hated it so much when I lived here the first time round. But however, um, yeah, I didn't, you know, I was late coming to class. I did my foundation year when I was 19, which introduced me to a lot of different techniques. Uh, but not glass, because there's no glass department of, in Northern Ireland. Um, so I knew at that stage that I wanted to work with my hands in some way, but I didn't know what. I knew it wasn't clay. <clears throat> It'd be quite a big ceramic school, but I knew that was not for me. Um, and so I went off actually and did something completely different for 10 years uh, and then came back to it to, do my, to actually do my degree um, when I was in my 30s and I, I just started having my family. And I suppose I came back thinking I would probably study textiles, which I did for a little while. But actually, as the degree went on, my work was probably more sculptural. And I was working with things like ice. And I suppose maybe that's where the, the idea of glass came in, you know, a substance that can change from one to the other. Can, you know, anyhow. So, I mean, as again, there's, there's no glass department up here. So when I started working with glass, it was... Um, uh, complicated because there was nobody really to ask. So I did a short course, a beginner's course with Carl Harren, who's a local glass artist, and just took it from there. But once I started working with it as a material, I just I suppose I really fell in love with it as a material. And I knew that's that was what I wanted to do. And I still bring my textile influence into my glass practice now. You would be really well known for um, working in a technique called uh, pape de verre. Would you just uh, share with people what that actually means? Yeah, so paste of glass, pape de verre means, it's translated from French to mean um, paste of glass. Um, and it just really involves any technique that uses crushed glass to cast with it, really. Um, Traditionally, pâte de verre would have been made, it goes way right back to Egyptian times, that's when it would have been first found, and would have made very small objects with a glass paste, like a glass powder, packed into these objects and fired so that the glass fused. Um, so you can use it, I think, when I started working with it in about 2010, I just felt it was such an adaptable material. I mean, you can use it in so many different ways. You can solid cast with it, you can make the traditional vessel form, you know, and you can sand cast it, which is what I do now. So there's a lot of different ways that you can interpret it as a technique, which I think is really, really nice. And people may be familiar with your work. Um, you were talking about using your textile uh, background there and incorporating your textiles, looking at a lot of pieces that are based on dress and uh, children's clothing and lace in particular. Um, talk to me about where that comes from and what, what that, uh, where, where that started with you. I think that started back in when I was doing my degree in the university because I'd gone back in and I just had Oshin who's now 14. God. <laughs> so he's now 14, but I just had him when I started my degree. And in between second and third year, I had James who is now, I don't know, 12 or something, which is ridiculous. Um, but I suppose in my family, there would always been textiles, a traditional Irish Household, you know, that's what women would have done, women's work. Uh, and old, you know, we had an old country house that my grandparents would have lived in, and it would, it would have had lots of, you know, like just handmade tablecloths and things like that that aunts would have done that I would never have met, but that's what women traditionally did. You know, they, they did their needlework before TV and stuff like that was invented. And um, so I suppose that was always an influence. And then when I started having my children, we have this beautiful, um, uh, christening robe. My dad sat at that side of the family um, and it hung in my room for quite a while, you know, when I christened Austin and then, you know, christened James in it as well. And I suppose this one piece of textile began making, making me think about the power of an object, about how this object 
um, could hold all this, all these stories really, you know, the story of the maker, what type of lace this was, where it would have come from, was it hand stitched? And then of course the story of all the people who have worn it and carefully looked after it. So to me, it was this kind of living, almost family tree type thing. And it just really got me thinking about, I suppose how objects can hold memory. And at that time specifically, I suppose I was looking at how that textile really represented um, the sort of the very fragile link between the start and the end of life. You when you're first born, you know, you're, you're, you're very, I think it's very fragile, you're very vulnerable, and at that very end stage of life um, as well. So I suppose that's what got me thinking um, about textiles in that way. I remember a piece that you made um, some years ago for a glass exhibition, an Irish glass exhibition, which was a beautiful christening bonnet with a, uh, yes. a number of teeth. Um, I can't remember the actual yes. name. Of, what was the name of that piece again? Called Jack Fell Down. That's right. Talk to me a little bit about that one. <laughs> so cheery. <laughs> so that I find that wee baby's bonnet on eBay. I've always liked collecting. Always like this. It's this, I suppose it's this idea of what an object can tell you. And it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be the truth. It can be, you know, a made up narrative. It can be a narrative to suit what you're trying to say. So we'll find this lovely little baby's bonnet. Um, it's an Irish crochet, which is a very, very fine type of crochet. It could well have dated right back into you know, the famine times because a lot of, you know, families would have made, you know, that's where Irish crochet would have, you know, come out of. And a lot of families would have made this Irish crochet uh, to survive, basically. So it had this really interesting history. And I suppose at that time, what I realized I was looking at was a mother's memories. So in the same way that I've put away my children's you know, baby shoes and you know, we all keep this sort of stuff. Um, this woman, whenever it was, has put away this bonnet very carefully. And you know, I've got my hands on it from buying it off eBay. So I started working with it and I made it a couple of times in Pat de Verre and it was very skull-like. So I decided to really investigate that idea of this sort of fragment <clears throat> and I was sandblasting it away as well. So it was more, had more of a lacy texture, more of a holy texture. And my mum, who was a dentist, a children's dentist, didn't really keep any of our clothes, I don't think, but she had all our baby teeth. So to me, this little skull like, you know, hat with the little you know, ring of teeth, you know, just really worked together. And at around that time as well, in uh, the North, well, in the UK, maybe, there was this awful case of child abuse that was all over the news at the time. And it sort of, it really resonated, I think, because the, the one photograph they showed of this child, who was maybe about two at the time, um, was, there was just a fleeting, you know, resonance with Oshin. And I suppose it just this, you know, just the horrendous cruelty case. And I think it sort of came out through that work in some way about, you know, childhood's meant to be this wonderful thing, but it's not necessarily for, you know, all children. I mean, so that was the inspiration behind that. Well, that leads us on very nicely to asking you about the exhibition that is, has been running in the National Museum in uh, Ireland, in Dublin, um, the Museum of Decorative Arts and History. Um, so is that correct? Addressing our truth? Hidden truth, sorry. <laughs> it's quite, it's yeah. quite a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> so talk to us, uh, talk to me a little bit about, uh, about that because it's an incredibly moving um, exhibition. I, I'll never forget walking through it and well, obviously, uh, being there for the opening night and listening to people, you know, with real experience and talking, uh, talking at that opening, it was just so profoundly moving. But tell tell people what what that's actually about. So, addressing our hidden truths came from um, a body of work that I had started in two thousand and seventeen. Um, I'd been commissioned uh, up in Portadown in Northern Ireland here, and at that time, again. There was this awful story that had come into the press about the Tum mother and baby home in County Galway. And if you hadn't heard, I mean, it did, the story did go worldwide, but if you hadn't heard of it, uh, a mother and baby home was somewhere that unmarried mothers would have gone to have their children in secret. It's generally, they were generally run by religious orders. Um, they were generally funded by the state. I mean, there was incredible shame to have an unmarried mother in your household and your family. So these women would have been secreted away and you know, had their babies in secret. 
And then I think they had to stay generally with them for a period of time, possibly up to a year. And then the babies would have been um, forcibly, uh, forcibly adopted, <clears throat> you know, maybe into the USA, maybe somewhere else in Ireland. So that, that, that was the background for these mother and baby homes. And there's also county homes which did the same thing as well. So in this particular um, mother and baby home in Galway, um, a, a local historian, Catherine Corliss, who lived in Chewham all her life and was very aware of the home, started to wonder where are the babies, where, where's the graveyard for these children who, you know, who died? She started collecting death certificates. I think in maybe about 1980, a couple of boys who'd been playing on the grounds of this home, the home was gone at this stage, found a couple of skulls, children's skulls. And I think people People at that time thought it was maybe you know a famine grave site and it was all hushed hushed up you know up and the priest came and blessed it and you know all covered up but she thought this was quite strange and it obviously you know made her think about it so she started getting all the death certificates from the council from the children that had died and out of the 800 odd death certificates she found she could only find the burial reports for a handful so she was then left wondering well where are these children and I suppose put two and two together and thought right there must be in this this pit and she started collating maps and all this and, and found out that this used to be a part of the old sewage system of the home or some sort of water holding tank or you know something like this so to cut a long story short she came out with the idea that these 796 children that were missing <clears throat> presumed dead um were in this pit essentially on the grounds of the mother and baby home and this story got picked up eventually by, I think it was the Daily Mail Online, which is like one of the biggest news organizations. So this story went worldwide um, and plenty has been said about it. And in recent times, the um, commission, the Irish government have gone in and, and started to investigate the site. And I found that actually, yes, that you know, there is, there may not be 796 children buried there, but there's a significant amount of human remains. So that was the backdrop to me making work for this exhibition and I decided what I wanted to talk about in this exhibition was things that we don't like talking about in public. You know, this idea of the you know, mothers going away and, you know, hiding their children or uh, another, another topic that I, I considered then was domestic violence or um, rape, sexual assault. So I sort of tackled issues that are not really talked about in, you know, polite society. And off the back of that exhibition, we actually got uh, Dr. Audrey Whitty from the museum came up and opened the exhibition in Portadown in 2017. And then she saw the exhibition and obviously liked parts of it and decided that she would bring it to the museum. So that's a very long story as to how it ended up in the museum. But <laughs> we then opened it in the museum in March 2019. And it'll run there until the end of this year, I've been told now. So incredibly significant to have um, that exhibition in a national institution. Do you want to talk a little bit about the impact of that? Um, yes, well, I mean, it's been really, um, well, it's excellent to do. <laughs> I have to say that first up, you know, to have the might of a, an institution, you know, to help you put on an exhibition, to help you house your work, to frame it the way that they framed it, you know, to... So I mean that that's, that's really been amazing. Um, I'm very I'm very touched and honoured, I suppose, that Audrey saw the potential in the work, you know, that it would work in there. Because at that time, when I was working for the show and poured it down, um, you know, I was putting out proposals before the exhibition went up, during the exhibition, and you know, to try and get it to somewhere else, and it just got turned down all over the place. So, you know, at least you know Audrey saw the potential in it, and um, when we first went to see the space, I wasn't, I was a bit, oh, I don't really know how it's going to work in here, you know, because in Portadown, the space had been completely different, very big and very open, but, you know, she could see the potential in it. And, um, I mean, it was great to work with that body of people. You know, it was like having staff. <laughs> it was lovely. <laughs> so, I mean, but, I've been but also the very honoured. <laughs> Also, the significance of the actual institution, you know, at, um, mm. on the subject, um, and yes. having that whole framework of not of the national institution, um, you know, actually supporting 
the 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 subject matter and also you know the the educative projects around that as well um what yeah. is that kind of how has that kind of impacted you then I think that's got all got to do with Lynn uh, Scarf, who's now the director of the National Museum. She's come from a slightly different background. Um, so she's come from like the science gallery. So like much more modern feeling, you know, forward thinking, maybe less, slightly less collections based in the museum. So, I mean, it, it was just great timing that she came into position when Audrey was offering her this exhibition, because I really think um, the museum is in an excellent position to take these issues and to give people safe space to talk about this, to, to think about it. And, you know, and the way that they framed it was it was an artist's response. So almost in a way, the museum didn't have to take the pressure of saying, you know, this is what happened or, you know, they, they didn't have to, they could sort of offload it onto me and go, oh, well, you know, Alison has taken these facts and she's interpreted them which is a really interesting way of a museum dealing with some very sensitive and tricky issues. You know, and I think they're really progressive in the way that um, they're moving on with, you know, LGBT history. They did a big project around it, you know, in their collections, you know, and that, that's really what we need our museums to be doing to, um, you know, to, just to really to hit things head on. And we can't, you know, we can't hide things in Ireland anymore. It's out there, it's out in the open and we need to face it. You know. Yeah, they had that um, a beautiful Joe Castlin piece actually um, on the wall, um, the big mural on the wall in the courtyard. And also they've been really engaged in um, rapid collecting all around the referendums, yeah. both referendums that we've had, collecting mm -hmm. material um, from, from the marriage referendum and also the abortion referendum. Mm -hmm. So I think they are really moving in the right, uh, in the right direction and, and making things you know, that are re very relevant as well as valuing what they have in their collection, which yeah. is massive. Um, and have you been involved in outreach projects? Obviously that exhibition now, nobody can go and see it right now. So what, <laughs> what is happening around that, um, around that exhibition then? Is there, has it moved online or what's the story? I th think they're relaunching their website, possibly even sometime this week. Um, so I don't, I, you know, I haven't been privy to what, what's happening there. Um, I know I have done some talks, I have done some outreach stuff um, alongside the museum. But, you know, I suppose at the minute, I don't know what they're doing, you know, forward thinking, because obviously everything's so up in the air because nobody knows when anything's opening again or, you know, so I know that they are relaunching their website. So keep an eye out for that. And I don't know um, if they're if they're looking to do more online stuff of what they've got, I, I really don't know at the moment. There, there are some beautiful video pieces already existing of of the pieces from that show, so we'll put some links together for that. Um, but you can you have your studio right there at home. You can you can continue working right now, can't you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> except you have I to homeschool. <laughs> yeah, except you have to homeschool at the same time. I was having this hey! conversation. <laughs> I was having this conversation with uh, with Father yesterday. You know the sort of the um, the input uh, the the implication that creative people can be creative and the pressure that that brings. That you know we have. Yeah. Time now and we should be making stuff when actually you're you know you're completely consumed with what's going on and maybe not maybe paralyzed and not be able to create um, and certainly if you're homeschooling and trying to run a household and and do your own work it's not a, it's not that particularly easy so how how is it for you i i'm i'm on the paralyzed bit i think at the minute i just really feel i just i don't know it, it, as you say you know it can be tricky enough. To, I always find it hard when the children are at home anyway, you know, like for summer holidays to get out in the studio because you're you're having to look after them the whole time. But yeah, I just, I mean, I do have a, a project coming up, a commission that I could be working on. I have all the glass there. My studio's just out the back. But I just, you know, I know that it's it was meant to be being installed in June, but I've had, you know, a conversation with the curator there and she said, it's going to be pushed. We don't know when to, but it's not going to happen then. So I think, well, maybe I'm learning about myself that I really need to have that pressure to, to force me out into the studio. But yeah, I just feel very, I couldn't be bothered at the minute, to be honest. Like. 
yeah, your head is your head is somewhere else at the moment, and you know that's a very natural a natural thing. Um, I'm, I've spoken to a number of different artists who are feeling in the same kind of way. You know, just sort of trying to process what's actually happening right now. And just before the pandemic, um, what were you working on? What what were what were the uh, projects that you were working on? Um, I got offered a really nice uh, small commission for Downpatrick County Museum, which is about ten miles away from here. Um, they would collect a lot of local crafts people's work. Um, they have a very, very, I should also say they have a very, they don't have any of my work in the collection, so they were thinking about trying to build up part of their collection and trying to build glass into it. So they thought they have a very old jail and they want to do some redesigning of this jail cells. So they thought about inviting me in to respond to the jail cells in some way in the stories. So that was, that was the commission that's coming up in June. Uh, which is really nice because that's really the way that I like to work. You know, I like to really get into the history, the sort of nitty gritty of something. And again, how an object can kind of tell a story, you know, so that was, that was right up my street and I have that in the background. Um, and I also, I'm starting a project, I've been trying to start a project with uh, an aerial artist who got in touch with me um, to do some work regarding the Magdalene laundries. So I think now I, I mean, we were meant to meet up. We've met up a couple of times, but we haven't actually done any tangible work yet as to how it's going to start. She's got a little bit of funding, and I think we were, were hoping to get a theatre company involved as well to direct us. So we'll see where that ends up. I mean, that's completely, you know, completely out of my comfort zone. I really have no, you know, idea about theatre or performance or one thing. So it's kind of interesting how these things are, um, you know, like, how they'll inform my practice going forward. And um, you have you have worked collaboratively with a number of different people. The pe the pieces in the museum there are there are a number of collaborations that you have. Is that something that you you see yourself doing a lot in the future, or um, you know, is it something that you touch in and out of, or just what, as projects arise? No, I, I kind of like I I some you know some of the collaborations um, worked better than others, and I learned a lot from the exhibition in Porta Down because I did do a lot of collaborative work there. And I suppose I learned how to, how to manage those, um, how to manage a collaboration better. Um, so yes, I, I could see myself doing a lot more of that because I don't feel that I need to do everything myself. You know, if somebody else has a skill, I don't see why I should have to learn it. If you can go here, could you, do you want to work with me? Or, and I think you can get something really interesting out of two people working together. And I suppose a lot of the stuff that um, I was kind of thinking of, you know, a lot of the, like the, the laundries, the, the mother and baby homes, you know, it's, it's more than one person's voice, you know, so yeah. when you work collaboratively, you get, you know, there's other people's voices involved as well, which is nice. I often think of you when you're dealing with this material all the time, you know, whenever I engage with it, it's very, I find it very difficult um and very it weighs very heavily on me how do you how do you um how do you work through that for yourself so that you're not being pulled down you're always so bright and and uh optimistic and cheery i think <laughs> I, I often wonder how how you you know re remove yourself from that kind of thinking you know when you're really deep into a project oh well yeah sometimes it you know I think sometimes it does impact you, um, definitely. I don't know, I, you know, some people did make an interesting comment to me with regarding the project in Dublin and that because I'm from the North, I know you'll understand this, international people might not, but because I'm from the North, I'm almost looking in, which I thought was really interesting. You know, so, I mean, and Audrey would have said that, oh, you're really brave taking the subject matter on, which I was kind of like, am I? You know, I don't really, but maybe, it, it helped me a little because I was kind of standing on the outside and looking in almost. I wasn't in the middle. I know that, that up here in the north, there's a there's a report that's due to be published soon about the mother and baby homes that were in the north. Um, you know, and there was mother and baby homes, and there was laundries, and there was you know, abuse within institutions. And I will do some work around that as well. But and I wonder, will that be harder because it's kind of almost on my own patch, if that doesn't sound ridiculous. Well, I don't, I, I don't know if I ever told you this or not, but um, when I was in my 20s, I, um, 
I lived in Fitzwilliam Square, right in the city centre. And um, we didn't have a washing machine at the time. And I used to bring our sheets up to uh, the laundry in Donnybrook, which was actually mm -hmm. a mandolin laundry. And, and I yeah, never knew, yeah. you know. And so there is that sort of, you know, where you, have, where you live along this thing and you, you, you then, you know, you're looking back at it retrospectively. It's, it's, it's mm -hmm. very, very shocking, you know, that it's really so recent um, in our own history, mm -hmm. you know, and extraordinary you know, I think the material that you're using, you know, brings something else to the conversation. Have you, you know, in choosing the materials that you were working with, um, I know you changed some of them in the in the exhibition that where you're working with solid casting and, and the fragility of Pat de Vere. Um, is that that's a conscious effort that you're you're working in those two different kind of medium? Um, in terms of uh, sort of solidity and sort of fragility, is that what you mean? Um, when I was thinking specifically about the scissors, there was a piece that's all to do with the hanging scissors and some of the punishments. And actually it was when I was at, in, to begin with, I knew I wanted to cast scissors and I was maybe going to make them in Pat de Vere. But when I went round, you know, when I was just doing a recce of the exhibition, and of course, all your work was in at the time, you know, when the, the beautiful lights and, the, you know, all the cut glass was sparkling and shining. And I was like, oh, no, these scissors are going to have to be solid cast and they're going to be have to cast in you know, leaded glass and gaffer so I can get them dipped, you know, because the lights were just. And so, you know, sometimes, OK, you know, there's a concept, there's a conceptual thing. But sometimes, you know, when you when you see you know, the situation, you know, the, most of that work was pretty site specific in that, you know, because they had all the display cases were all already made, you know, so uh, when I saw the lighting, I was like, oh no, it has to be shiny. <laughs> 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 so nothing really to do with fragility or anything at all. <laughs> so tell, tell, just talk a little bit then about how you, how you start uh, your, your process then. Do you, are, is it through drawings or is it through research or, you know, how do you actually go, are you working very straight into the process or... I know you're using found materials quite a bit to cast from, but how, how do you actually go? What's the step before that? I love my research. <clears throat> so when I was thinking about doing something for the, about, sorry, about the Magdalene Laundries, um, I, I just really buried myself in research. I mean, it's very hard. It was very hard to get firsthand research. You know, maybe if I'd been more connected to the, to sort of um, historians at that time, a bit, a bit more so now, I, I might have found it easier to find those contacts, you know, but at that time it was, it was kind of tricky. So you were looking at books, you're trying to find, grab stuff off the internet. Um, you know, I've, I've subsequently actually had a tour around the Donnybrook laundry that you, you talked about. I mean, it's all about to be knocked down, which is, well, it's a ghastly place, but you know, so, but that was, that was after the effect. So it was actually, I find it really hard to, to illustrate, to talk about the Magdalene Laundries through objects because there is no physical objects really. You know, I went to, I was thinking about the clothing when you would have gone into a Magdalene Laundry, they would have possibly taken away your name and given you a different name. They would have taken away all your clothes and belongings and given you a uniform. So I kind of thought it would be interesting to see an actual uniform and I went to the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum, I know the textile curator up here, and said, would you have anything in your collection? She said, no, we don't have anything like that. I went to the National Museum of Ireland and said, would you have anything? And you, this, they, these sort of items, these utilitarian items were never collected because there was no worth associated to them. So I couldn't find, I could find pictures. So I was, you know, I was kind of always working off pictures, but, and then of course, when I was thinking about that exhibition in, in the museum, it was also a bit strange because it's not like a gallery or I felt, now nobody told me this, you know, Audrey didn't say that I had to put it in like a museum context, but I think in a museum, I felt there was more impetus in me to almost explain, you know, to, to explain what a Magdalene Laundry was about, you know, to explain how could they have possibly come about? How could they have lasted so long? You know, I'm trying to imagine myself as a, I don't know, a Spanish tourist walking around going, what is all this about? You know, so I did, I was probably more um, explanatory with my works and I gave them, I tried to give them titles that had, you know, real meaning, you know, um, to, to, in an attempt to explain how could this possibly have happened alongside, you know, 
an artistic interpretation. Yeah, well, I often ask myself now when I think of the Donnybrook Laundry, how, you know, how come I never really realised? Because when I think back now, um, mm -hmm. you know, we used to go down with our with our dirty sheets or I used to go down with the sheets mm -hmm. and it was very austere. It was kind of a little, just a little kind of a door, a very on nothing or nothing ornate or anything. And there was a, a kind of a shutter where um, you, you rang a bell and the shutter opened they took the laundry and then they like whacked it shut again. And I can still hear that sound in my head, you know, mm -hmm. and it was a small, you know, it was a small opening. It wasn't a, and it was, they were mm -hmm. always very dour, but I never, I never really, you know, never registered no. at the time or thought about it. You know, it was called the Swastika Laundry and, you know, they had vans going around all around the place and, you know, yeah. servicing all the hotels and all that sort of stuff. So it was very normal right. to sort of see, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Extraordinary. It's that hiding in plain sight thing, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, really extraordinary. So, um, what uh, what's coming up for you then? If you know when when <laughs> what what was going to come up for you, maybe is what I should be saying um, in in the future. And how like you know you're working full time from from making your art work all the time, um, and you're not necessarily in the public art um, a, a scene mm -hmm. really. You're working more with yeah. uh, commissions and with um, with. Uh, residencies and that kind of thing isn't that right yeah pretty much I mean I would like to uh, maybe at some stage I would like to take on a public art and see if I can do it you know but uh, you know it, it's if you don't have it on your CV it's very hard to break into that line of work you know so yes I mostly to make money I mostly teach and of course all that's been completely cancelled for the next few months um, I'm meant to be going out to Denmark in October to teach and I'm hoping that will still happen is that part of the um, European really... context? No, no, no. It's um, they had come come to me last year and asked. It's just a private Anla glass in Denmark. Um, I know they've had different glass artists there, so she just had asked me to come and teach. So, but no, nothing, nothing to do with them. Um, the European context this year. Okay, I just got um, the word today that the European context has been postponed. So. Um, oh, has it? until further notice yeah yeah um so and just talk about a little bit about your teaching then what uh what what are you you're teaching from from your studio there mm -hmm. yep um, I, I teach from a studio but of course if there's organizations you know that i'll travel to to teach as well you know i was meant to be going down to creative spark and dundalk which is a great organization you know i would do a couple of i'd probably be down there maybe i don't know once or twice a year maybe um, and then I'd have different classes from my home. Now, I would say over the past year, it's been really quiet. And I don't know if, if that's been the Brexit effect. You know, people feel that they have less money or there's less money going around anyhow. So, and I would say that was the quietest year I've had for gallery sales and sales of my classes and workshops and things. So, I don't know, <clears throat> you know, but yes, I've just had pieces we were both really. part of that uh, amazing exhibition the homo faber in uh, in on oh, yes. island in morano in fact the last time i talked to you actually was in morano in, in venice in, <laughs> isn't that correct wow <laughs> what an amazing amazing time that was oh, that was brilliant that was really great shall we go now Oh, Venice would be lovely now because we oh. still quiet <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it, it, they're both yeah. amazing uh, yeah, that was nice. I love, do you know, that's one bit of my job. I mean, I see all the scratching along, trying to make money. I can be bothered with it, you know. Uh, you know, and it's torture because you just want to make what you want to make. But anyhow, you have to do the finance side. But the one thing I love about my job is that I can travel. You know, I get to travel. Now, I can't, I can't travel lots because of the kids and I can't, you know, but I get to go to places like Venice or I was recently in Pittsburgh Glass Center and it's just, just you just get to see a city with fresh eyes and meet new people and oh, just I love that but that's great. So you did a residency at Pittsburgh. I forgot about that. Tell me, tell me how yes. that went and what what did you do there? Um, I had been selected. They had an open call there recently for an exhibition called United, um, which hopefully is still happening. It's happening. It's going to be happening in October, I think, this year. So fingers crossed, it still will. Um, and it was meant to be about immigration. 
So I went in with a proposal and as part of that open call, they said, if you want to come over here in a residency and make the work here, you can do that. So I was like, <laughs> yes, please. Happy day. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> so um, oh, I had such a good time. It was just really, really nice. It's fantastic. It made a bit of stained glass. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm quite interested in stained glass. I've, I've quite, I've, I've really enjoyed it actually. I was over there. I was going to make a, a piece talking about uh, basically transportation of, of women, you know, to because it was to do with the kind of the jail theme that I was looking at in Down County Museum, you know, when women were or children, people were transported uh, to the colonies. So that was going to be my thing. So I was going to try and make a uh, like a, um, a shawl, you know, like the, oh, you would see all the famine women wearing the shawls, you know, because they were just dressed in rags. So that was my plan. It didn't really work out, <laughs> but while I was there, you know, I had uh, a bit of time and made some stained glass and actually blew some glass as well. So it did lots of glassy things that I haven't done before. So very good. good. I love I love the Pittsburgh uh, Glass Centre. It's a super place, really, really amazing Fantastic. facility. Yeah, right. Well, wouldn't, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a facility like that here in Ireland? Um, I dream. Of oh, that. wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, listen, that's been absolutely fantastic chatting to you. Um, I could stay here and chat away, as you well know. And we, you know, if we had a little glass of wine or whatever, it'd be even nicer. Come on. <laughs> listen, Get until... the Prosecco popped. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, until we can meet again, uh, look after yourself. Yes. And uh, look after everybody else there as well. And um, don't worry too much about the creative process. You've taken on an awful lot and you know, sometimes your mind needs to rest. So we look forward to meeting you again. This is true. I know, I know, this is true. Angie, thank you very much for the interview. All right, cheers, bye. 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 <clears throat>